Okay. I really was interested in uh, your your book, how an ugly Canadian instead of an ugly American, and I thought that was a really great title for us to talk about because uh, the way Trudeau is going right now, it seems pretty awful. But I don't know if the, the Conservatives would they be any better. But I want to get uh, your opinion on that, Eve, and uh, welcome to speak. Are we going to do a chalice lighting? We're going to do it for the business meeting. Okay. So, so first of all, thanks for thanks for inviting me. Um, and uh, so, basically, what I prepared was uh, just a maybe twenty five minutes on Justin Trudeau's foreign policy. Uh, I have a book that came out a couple of years ago, uh, <clears throat> The House of Mirrors: Justin Trudeau's Foreign Policy which the book's in working title was The Ugly Canadian, Justin Trudeau's Foreign Policy, um, which was based upon a previous book I did called The Ugly Canadian, Stephen Harper's Foreign Policy back in 2012. And uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, the difference between Stephen Harper's ugly foreign policy and Justin Trudeau's foreign policy is not very significant. Uh, much, much more that's the same. And in recent days, we've seen that play out very uh, uh, overtly in, with regards to Mexico and the Mexican government, uh, leftist government that has very strong popular support, uh, pursued some uh, mining reforms, some uh, changes to the mining legislation that um, better protections of water, uh, uh, reduced concession period, the time of the, the company has a concession, uh, a minimum of 10% of profits to go to local communities, type, type of reforms that would be, I think, first of all, the vast majority of Mexican support, and most people from outside would see as a, as a positive development to clean up uh, a sector that has had incredible amounts of abuses, ecological, human rights. The Trudeau government's reaction to that has been to openly criticize the Mexican government, uh, minister, uh, um, Canada's trade minister, uh, publicly two weeks ago, she criticized the Mexican government's reforms. Then she had a meeting with her U.S. counterpart where they, in the statement that came out, criticized the reforms. Then the Canadian ambassador in uh, Mexico City uh, last week, alongside a handful of Canadian mining companies, met with the uh, Mexican economy minister, um, so they're very openly lobbying against a some fairly modest but positive reforms to the mining sector because Canadian mining companies are two thirds of all the mining companies in Mexico, foreign mining companies in Mexico are Canadian. Canadian companies are very you know dominant players, um, and this is what this is what the ugly Canadian does. I mean, they the Canadian embassy in in Mexico City has backed Canadian companies that, you know, implicated in murders, human rights violations. There's been many protests in front of the Canadian embassy by communities opposed to Canadian mining companies and specifically to Canada backing those, those companies. And this is just the latest example. If you look at their policy, uh, many different uh, instances, Canadian diplom diplomacy under Trudeau has continued with Harper's policies in backing Canadian mining companies. Probably the most egregious example was in Tanzania back in 2017. Big conflict uh, with, with um, uh, Barrick Gold, Toronto-based company, biggest gold mining company in the world, um, accused of, of, of siphoning off billions of dollars in unpaid uh, or failing to pay taxes and royalties. Huge conflict with the uh, Tanzanian government like, you know, top news item in Tanzania. Barrick's North Mara mine in northern northern Tanzania um, has been the site of dozens and dozens and dozens of deaths. One estimate was something like 70 global mail. This is from I mean, a couple of years ago, gold mail business section. And most of those deaths were uh, small scale miners who, who were basically looking for nuggets of gold. And they entered Barrick's uh, uh, the concession area and the security forces, police, in part police paid for by Barrick and the company security forces killed them. 
the people who are searching for the gold, they dispute Barrick's right to control the territory. That's a whole broader thing. Nevertheless, we're talking about dozens and dozens of deaths. So this is Barrick's most controversial mine, the North Mara mine. In, and, and, and you have uh, this huge dispute over uh, unpaid taxes. Well, the, the Canadian High Commissioner in Tanzania organizes a meeting by the, by the head of Barrick with the president of Tanzania. And then after the meeting, uh, um, Ian Miles, Canada's uh, diplomatic representative in, in Tanzania, head diplomat in Tanzania, says, Canada is very proud that it expects all its companies to respect the highest standards, fairness, and respect for laws and corporate social responsibility. We know that Barrick is very much committed to those values. If you can back Barrick Gold in the country where their worst abuse is the worst most abusive Canadian mining company where it's mo worst abuses amidst a very high profile uh, dispute over unpaid royalties and taxes, you can back any Canadian mining company anywhere. And that's more or less what the Trudeau government has done. And it's not just diplomatic backing, right? It's, it's a matter of signing more foreign investment protection, foreign investment protection agreements that give mining companies the right to sue countries and in international tribunals. For lost profits. So it, it entrenches Canadian mining companies' uh, uh, position in Burkina Faso, in Guatemala, et cetera. Uh, uh, Export Development Canada support for the mining companies, uh, trade commissioner service, and huge amounts of Canadian aid money. Uh, during Trudeau, we're talking about a, at least 100 million, it's probably a couple hundred million, in funding, Canadian aid funding to projects that basically enable uh, the high, Canada's highly controversial uh, uh, mining uh, uh, sector. Now, simultaneously, the Trudeau government, as you, as people certainly know, Canadian mining companies, examples of abuses by Canadian mining companies, companies in almost every country in the global south, from Congo to uh, uh, Philippines, uh, Papua New Guinea to uh, Ecuador, you find an example of a Canadian mining company uh, accused of or responsible for destroying ecosystem, waterway, or you know killing people or some other sort of human rights abuse. The Trudeau government, before it was elected, promised to bring in an, an ombudsperson that would clean up right the worst abuses, and more specifically, an ombudsperson that would allow, that would end public support for Canadian companies found to be engaged in significant abuses abroad. So we're not, I'm not talking about throwing the, the CEOs into jail. We're talking about just ending Export Development Canada support, Trade Commissioner support, basically public diplomatic support in, one other, in different ways, uh, ending public support for a company found to be responsible for major abuse abroad. It should be a pretty low bar. Well, the Trudeau government announced they would they committed to that. Then they began the process very slow the first couple of years. Then they announced an ombudsperson that actually looked pretty good. The powers that they were announced looked pretty good. Then the mining industry started their lobbying, hard lobby campaign over a year. And then what from the announcement in 2018 to what was actually created a year later, basically no power to compel companies uh, to provide testimony or evidence uh, and, no, and very little power to provide sanction. So basically the ombudsperson has the ability to ask the minister to apply sanction, doesn't have the power to do that themselves. Basically it's a toothless ombudsperson. And in the last few weeks, the Globe and Mail has, has, has uh, reported on the fact that it, all of the groups uh, this is this goes back a couple of years. All the groups who are pushing for the ombudsperson have said basically, and that initially back the the initial announcement in 2018, they've all resigned. They all say no one should have anything to do with this ombudsperson. Has no power. It's all just public relations. And so, on one hand, you have them, the Trudeau government, diplomatically backing Canadian mining companies, providing aid and other forms of support to Canadian mining companies, and um, not doing anything quite frankly, when it comes to the big promise of an ombudsperson to uh, end the worst of the abuses of Canadian mining companies. So, so Trudeau, um, maybe not quite as bombastic in its rhetoric in support of the mining sector as the Harper government, but 
I would say at least, you know, 95%, 97% of the continuation of backing this highly controversial uh, Canadian mining sector. And I should point that people probably know Canada is like more than half of the world's mining companies are based in, uh, in mostly in Toronto, somewhat in Vancouver and, and other cities across the country. So Canada has, you know, 0.5% of the world's population has half of the world's com- uh, uh, international mining company. So it's, you know, global uh, powerhouse in the mining sector. And Trudeau has very much continued uh, with that. Uh, if you look at some of their, you know, they're just blatant hypocrisy. Uh, you know, they announced that they support uh, the abolition of nuclear weapons, and yet they boycott the the meeting to negotiate the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. They oppose all the UN votes on the Treaty of Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons that two thirds of the world's countries attended the meeting. More than two thirds of the world's countries vote in support of uh, the TPNW. They talk about a feminist foreign policy, but then continue this massive light armored vehicle sale to uh, to Saudi Arabia. They talk about uh, uh, the climate crisis. Uh, they do talk about the climate crisis, but if you look at the um, the Canadian greenhouse gas emissions, they're going up. They continue they continue to rise, and the of course the pipelines, the sub, big huge subsidy for tar sands pipeline. Uh, the Bay du Nord here, uh, you know, up to a billion, they agreed to that about a year ago, extraction of another billion, up to a billion more barrels of oil. Uh, Trudeau himself, when he was in uh, speaking to the oil sector in Houston, uh, I think in 2017, he he made that infamous comment about no country would find would have uh, 173 billion barrels of oil and just leave it in the ground. Well, yes, we need to leave the tar sands in the ground. I'm sorry. <laughs> humanity needs that to be left in the ground. And, and it's not just a, a generalized humanity. What we see is we see recent uh, floods in the Congo and uh, parts of Rwanda and Uganda. We see that those who, who have very little responsible for the climate crisis uh, are facing the brunt of it. We see that with what's been going on in Somalia with the horrible uh, uh, droughts. The primary victims of the climate crisis are, are people in places who are responsible for almost none, right? Uh, Canada's greenhouse gas emissions per capita are towards a hundred times what what we see in you know for Congolese. Um, so it's there's incredible uh, injustice at the heart of of this this indifference uh, of the of the Trudeau government to take the to take the uh, to take the issue uh, seriously. Israel has has uh, committed another. Uh, bout of its uh, violence against Palestinians in the last handful of days. I think it's now up to 33 or 35 uh, Palestinians killed in Gaza. And this is, you know, every so often Israel decides they want to kill more Palestinians and they begin the process and they always give some claim about terrorists or this or that. Um, but uh, but the apartheid state... Um, is uh, is uh, you know continues to dispossess Palestinians, continues to to kill them, and the, with with the backing of the Trudeau government, right? Uh, and that backing has many facets to it: uh, historic, current. They voted against the Trudeau go- government's voted against something like seventy UN resolutions upholding uh, Palestinian rights. Some of those resolutions backed by like one hundred and seventy six countries. In one instance. Uh, in terms of supporting Palestinian statehood, uh, 176 countries voted for it. The only countries that voted against were Canada, the U.S., Israel, and uh, Micronesia and uh, Paolo, I believe. Uh, you have uh, the Canadian ambassador in uh, in Tel Aviv, uh, Deborah Lyons, back in 2020. She actually organized a pizza party for Canadians fighting in the Israeli military. Uh, now, why the head Canadian diplomat in any country would organize a party for Canadians fighting in another country's military is beyond me. Uh, not something that happens. That's not what you do. Um, but in this context, we're talking about a military enforcing the apartheid system in the West Bank, uh, you know, bombing Syria on a weekly basis in recent years. Obviously, uh, uh, bouts of 
violence against Palestinians in Gaza. And the Trudeau government has, you know, in this case, uh, celebrates Canadians fighting in the IDF. There's been a campaign about, uh, it's illegal to recruit for a foreign military uh, in Canada, the Foreign Enlistment Act. And, and but, but there's been a lot of that going on. And the, when this campaign so, petition and actual uh, legal submission, Canada's, uh, David Lametti, Canada's uh, justice minister, just throws it aside. We don't want to investigate this question of illegal recruitment for the Israeli military in Canada. And that goes with their general pro-Israel uh, uh, policy. When the International Criminal Court launched an uh, investigation of Israeli war crimes, the Trudeau government sent a letter uh, opposing that and, and alluding to the fact that Canada might cut off aid to the ICC if, if it moved forward with that in investigation. Uh, the Trudeau government signed a free trade or, or uh, augmented a free trade agreement that previous government had signed. That free trade agreement allows for products in the illegally uh, occupied West Bank uh, produced by set settlements uh, to enter Canada duty free. So it legitimates essentially Israel's occupation that the whole world, including the Canadian government, ostensibly considers contrary to international law. And of course, many, many comments, shared values comments by, um, by uh, Trudeau and other uh, ministers. Um, uh, Christian Freeland in 2018, when she was Canada's foreign minister, she, she, uh, when she was in Israel and Canada was pushing for its bid for a seat on the United Nations Security Council, that fortunately didn't it didn't get. Um, she said that that Canada getting a seat on the Security Council, telling us to the Israeli audience that Canada would act as an asset for Israel. So our seat sitting on the Security Council would be an asset for Israel. Just kind of things that you just you just never hear in other in other diplomatic vis-a-vis uh, -vis other other uh, other countries. So so the Trudeau government has con continued a policy of enabling Palestinian dispossession. This isn't new. I did a book, uh, Canada and Israel Building Apartheid, uh, back in 2010. There's a long history of Canadian support for Palestinian uh, uh, dispossession. And the Trudeau government has, uh, has, has not really budged on that and has uh, uh, continued that. Um, with regards to Latin America, if you look at uh, the Pedro Castillo, the elected uh, uh, leftist uh, president in uh, Peru, was ousted back in December. And um, um, the Trudeau government uh, aggressively uh, supported that, uh, and and the the usurper uh, Dina Boluarte, who took over, there was more than sixty people killed, mostly indigenous, in the repression of the protests against the ouster of uh, Castillo, and uh, Canada's ambassador in uh, Lima, uh, Luis Marcotte, he. He worked really hard in the six weeks, two months after the, the coup, when the Boulevarte uh, uh, regime was, was very tenuous, um, when there was major protests and many countries in the hemisphere, most countries in the hemisphere refusing to recognize uh, Boulevarte. Um, the Canadian ambassador was very aggressive diplomatically in meeting with all the ministers, a whole bunch of ministers of of the of the uh, of the coup coup uh, replacement uh, uh, government met with the Boluarte, the replacement president, foreign minister, vulnerable populations minister, mining minister, uh, 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 attended the Peru Day at the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada uh, a conference in March in in Toronto. Um, so Canada provided substantive diplomatic uh, support. And all, if you look at all their rhetoric at the Organization of American States, their public statements always aligned with Washington's uh, position, which was to uh, uh, support uh, Castillo's uh, ouster. And that, that fits with their policy more generally in, in, in the hemisphere, right? In 2019, when Evo Morales was ousted, the, the Trudeau government very much backed that. They, they put out statement uh, immediately endorsing the very dubious organization American states electoral uh, mission that was designed to uh, or that that um, work to discredit uh, Evo Morales's election, uh, the results of the election, which justified the protest and then ultimately justified the the uh, military intervention. 
uh, Canada funded that. Canadian uh, uh, representatives were part of that OAS. Uh, and then that's been widely discredited, even in New York Times, Washington Post, that this was totally uh, dubious uh, electoral uh, claims against Evo Morales. And also was, of course, shown a year later when uh, Morales' forces won when they forced a new election that they were refusing to hold, they won the presidency and, and overwhelming Congress and, and all almost all of the uh, elected positions in the country. Um, and uh, Christian Freeland, who was then the foreign minister, was very aggressive in immediately endorsing the ouster of, of Morales, claiming it was a step forward for, for democracy. Uh, also, with regards to Venezuela, you look at Canada had an incredible campaign to try to overthrow Venezuela's government. That's completely collapsed now. Juan Guaido, uh, just recently, he fled to the U.S. Uh, his whole claim to the presidency that Canada was backing has, has collapsed. Uh, but the Canada was right at the heart of, of the whole Juan Guaido uh, uh, process of this marginal elector, uh, marginal politician from the far right in Venezuelan opposition, not you know, a very marginal even within the opposition in, in Venezuela, the fourth party, the Voluntad Popular, the fourth party in Venezuela. And the Trudeau government is right at the heart of pushing the, the, um, the uh, Guaido, Guaido process, help coordinate getting the opposition behind that in advance of Guaido declaring himself president. Canada had been part of the Lima group that set up back in 2017 of groups of countries to oppose the Maduro government. Uh, sanctions policy, bringing Venezuela to the International Criminal Court, and uh, op uh, funding opposition groups, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so in the hemisphere, the Trudeau government has very much worked against the the um, the uh, socialistic, the Latin American integrationist uh, governments. Now that has the the right wing tide has shifted, and now we're back to a. a a whole a bunch of more progressive governments in Brazil and in, in uh, Honduras and Chile and in Colombia. And so, and to a large extent, the Trudeau government's policy in Latin America has failed. It's clearly failed in Venezuela. It failed in Bolivia in a very kind of stark way in that a year later, the coup was, you know, electorally overturned. Um, it's, it's had a bit of success in Peru, uh, but, but there's been a, a real shift back towards a more Latin American integrationist, uh, socialistic minded, nationalistic minded uh, uh, policy, which is very much against what uh, what the Trudeau government has been uh, pushing. Briefly on Haiti, um, Haiti, of course, is um, is a disaster at this point. Uh, uh, the Trudeau government continued with previous liberal and and conservative government policies, of course, in two thousand four. Canada helped overthrow uh, uh, Haiti's elected government um, uh, uh, that was the most popular government in Haitian history and had the strongest ele electoral legitimacy in Haitian history. Canada invaded Haiti with the US and France to oust the uh, elected uh, president and also thousands of other elected officials. Um, Back the back the coup government for two years, and then um, 2010 intervened with the U.S. after that horrible earthquake to uh, basically have uh, Michel Martelly, a uh, uh, a criminal, uh, somebody who was uh, tied to the uh, Duvalier's uh, the Tonton Macout, the death squad of the Duvalier dictatorship, uh, make Michel Martelly president in 2010, and the PHTK, his 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 party, has basically ruled Haiti. Uh, since that time, and in when there were huge protests in the early parts of uh, Trudeau government uh, in Haiti against Jovenel Moïse, who uh, Michel Martelly handpicked as uh, as his uh, uh, a predecessor um, or as his successor, should I say, uh, uh, the the Trudeau government very much backed the the um, uh, um, uh, Jovenel Moïse. And then 22 months ago, after Moise was assassinated in the middle of the night, um, we, with the U.S., appointed uh, um, uh, Ariel Henry to lead the country. So, so the Trudeau government has very much, after the U.S., Canada is the second power in Haiti through the core group of foreign ambassadors. Canada has had incredible influence over Haiti over the past two decades. And that continues. 
and the Trudeau government um, uh, continues the, the basics of that policy, though there's interesting developments. If people have questions, I'm happy to, I'm just finishing a book on the history of Canada's role in Haiti. So I'm happy to get into, into details on, on, on Haiti, um, but that's uh, very much uh, 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 continued this uh, imperialistic policy in, in Haiti. Now, it, for the final issue that I thought I'd cover, and I'll cover it in a little bit of detail because it's, of course, the most, um, uh, you know, biggest issue on the agenda, and it's the most controversial issue, which is the question of Canada's role in uh, in Ukraine and in terms of fighting uh, uh, Russia. Um, first of all, I consider Russia's invasion contrary to international law. That seems pretty clear. It's also brutal, uh, but there's a, a number of facets that are uh, left out in the dominant media. Most importantly, that it was provoked, very clearly provoked, and Canada played a central role in, in provoking that. Um, Canada is at war with Russia. That's how I would see where, where we're at now. Uh, of course, a couple of days ago, there was a report of two more Canadian, former Canadian soldiers uh, killed fighting near Bakhmut. Uh, that makes, I think, five, officially there's been at least five former Canadian soldiers killed fighting. There's been reports about Canadian special forces on the ground. Uh, Canada provides intelligence. That's a very underreported element of support to, to the fight against Russia. Uh, uh, um, intelligence uh, support to the Ukrainian military. Uh, you have, of course, incredible amounts of Canadian weapons that have been sent to um, uh, Ukraine. You know, not at least since World War II has anything uh, uh, comparable happened. Uh, Le Devoir, on the one year anniversary, Le Devoir tabulated that it was $2.26 billion in arms donations. Uh, since uh, February of 2022 uh, by Canada. Uh, and there's been significant announcements since then. Um, alongside billions of dollars in uh, the, the whole package is now $8 billion in other government supports, uh, different types of aid, uh, uh, IMF funding, et cetera. Um, and of course you have a major uh, Canadian training mission, Canada's training Ukrainian forces uh, just just uh, two days ago announced that at a third country where we're training Ukrainian forces in Latvia. So we've been training Ukrainian forces over the past year in Poland and in in uh, in the UK, and now we're also training Ukrainian forces in in Latvia, and that's part of the um, Operation uh, Unifier. Uh, Operation Unifier is something that Canada began in 2015 under Harper, though Trudeau would uh, would extend it and expand it. And Operation of Fire, as the Russians pointed out at the time, uh, the Russian embassy and reported on in the Globe and Mail, that began uh, 200 Canadians training Ukrainian forces. And what the Russians pointed out at the time, which I think is correct, was that there was a civil war going on in eastern Ukraine. And we were, uh, and, and there had been the Minsk, uh, two peace accords signed in February, uh, two months before Operation Unifier began, that was supposed to end, try to end the conflict in the eastern Ukraine. And what Operation Unifier was designed to do was to undercut the Minsk Two Peace Accord uh, and basically put Canada into a low level uh, uh, proxy war with Russia. So we were supporting one side that was fighting in eastern Ukraine and Russia was supporting the other side. Now, I, th I think it's exaggerated in our media how much Russia was supporting the other side, but they clearly were supporting the, the, the other side. And, and of course, the US and UK were also involved. And we trained huge numbers of, of uh, Ukrainian forces. Uh, uh, they announced, uh, now they're announcing 36,000 Ukrainian forces have been trained by Canada. And, um, and the Americans and British were involved uh, as well and, and arms. And the uh, Trudeau government continued that. Like I said, they, they expanded it. They initially, Canadian trainers were only allowed in Western Ukraine, but they allowed them to also go closer to the front line. And then in, in the summer of 2018, uh, Canada's international development minister, Bibo, um, she actually went to the, the point of contact, like right on the front line. It was the first G7 minister 
to go right to the front where the war was taking place in eastern Ukraine. And um, and part of what what um, what uh, the the uh, Operation Unify was about was was to um, make the Ukrainian military more inter interoperable with NATO, right? Uh, through tactics, weaponry. Um, and so it's basically prepare the train for Ukraine to join NATO. And you could argue that at this point, I think Ukraine is a de facto, you know, it's a de facto member of NATO. It's not, you know, formally part of NATO, but it's a de facto member of NATO. And, um, and so that's part of what Operation Unifier was about. And, and so this is another part to Canada's role in the, the provoking of, of, uh, of the war, uh, of Russia's invasion, is that Canada had been a major, major proponent of NATO expansion. This goes back to Jean Chrétien. I've, I've detailed this out. Um, despite the promises made to Gorbachev at the end of the Soviet Union, the Canada Chrétien government immediately, 93 Chrétien comes in, starts pushing for NATO expansion eastward, uh, despite breaking the promise, uh, promises, uh, and, and that's continued right until, I mean, right until today. And so in, in, uh, in January of, uh, mid-January of 2022, when there was 100,000 Russian troops on the border and Moscow was saying, we, you know, had put forward a, you know, a uh, 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 proposal to, to, to avoid a conflict. At the center of that, of course, was Ukraine not joining NATO. And I should back up here for a second. In 2014, Viktor Yanukovych was ousted, the elected president of, of uh, Ukraine. He was ousted. Canada played a very important role in Yanukovych's ouster. And a central reason why the U.S. and Canada ousted Yanukovych was because he brought in neutrality. Right? He brought in that Ukraine would not join NATO. And so therefore he had to be ousted. And and I and I just a lot of people say, well, Canada, oh yeah, Canada supported there was the the during the Maidan protests uh, from late 2013 to February 2014 that ultimately ousted Yanukovych. That they they actually the protesters, including far right, the C14 far right, actually were based in the Canadian embassy in Kiev, which is really close to Maidan Square, uh, and they used it as a base for more than a week in 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 their protests against the elected president. And uh, a lot of people sort of say, oh, yeah, yeah, Canada provided support to the Maidan protests, but that's just, you know, there was a popular movement. Nah, -uh. Canada was undermining Yanukovych from 2010, even though we had sent electoral uh, observers that gave an OK, gave a thumbs up. We opposed Yanukovych. We knew we already opposed Yanukovych. But despite that, the electoral observers that Canada sent, it was too clear it was a legitimate election. Um, so we played a, a substantive role in ousting of Yanukovych in, in large part because he opposed Ukraine, as did public opinion polls at that time, very clearly opposed Ukraine of Ukrainians, opposed Ukraine joining NATO because they knew that this was going to provoke a, a, uh, a reaction. And unfortunately, that's what we're uh, the horrors that we're in part uh, seeing are, are, are based upon that. So. In, 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 in mid-January of 2019, Foreign Minister Jolie goes to Kyiv and reiterates Canada supports Ukraine joining NATO, even though there's already large numbers of Ukraine, uh, Russian troops on the border. The Russians are calling for uh, negotiations, a, agreement to, to commit to not joining NATO, um, and uh, Canada just ratchet, ratcheted up the tension. And, and of course, there's other examples of that. Canada sending 2017, the Trudeau government sending uh, 700 Canadian troops. Well, initially it's 400 and something, and now it's over, I think it's seven, 800 now. Uh, troops to Latvia, which is right on Russia's doorstep. Uh, Canada leads a, a NATO battle group in La based in Latvia. There's, I think, about 2,000 uh, NATO troops that are under Canada's command in Latvia. Um, so so we, we've been, we pushed on a very aggressive posture uh, in Ukraine and elsewhere in Eastern Europe, vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Russia. This, is, this isn't new. Trudeau government has continued it, expanded it. And now what are we doing? Okay, so now this, you know, all kinds of devastation, terrible devastation in Ukraine. And what is Melanie Jolie? On the two, on the two year, on the one year anniversary uh, of Russia's invasion, she says, right now is not the time for negotiations. Right now is the time to arm. Okay. 
A couple of weeks later, she says, uh, uh, she, she, she calls for regime change in Moscow. A couple of weeks, weeks after that, China's proposal for a peace agreement. She disparages China's proposal for a peace agreement. So we keep sending weapons, keep fueling the war, while repeatedly stating we're against negotiations. Um, what does that mean? What does that mean is the more death, more destruction, um, more primarily Ukrainians dying, secondarily Russian soldiers, and then all the other effects in terms of hunger in other countries and the all the disruptions that come with this this horrible uh, 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 war. So um, that I think is you know any justice minded peace minded uh, uh, Canadian has to be that has to be the central issue we're campaigning on is pressuring Canadian politicians to to support the initiatives of the Brazilians. President Lula in Brazil pushing for negotiations. I uh, recently criticized Canada's policy. The Pope, the Pope is meeting with Zelensky's peace negotiation that the Pope is, put up, the Chinese have put stuff out there. Um, uh, the South Africans, the South African uh, high commissioner in Canada just recently criticized the Canadian government for, for opposing negotiations and fueling the war. Um, uh, there's uh, Turkey has, has been part of push for negotiations. Um, so this is, we, this has to be a central thing, but but to just conclude, because I, I think I've probably gone a bit along, longer than my, my allotted time, the Trudeau government has continued this ugly Canadian uh, policy of militarism, of pro-corporate, uh, pro-U.S. empire policy that we saw under Harper. Um, and we unfortunately have seen uh, throughout the history, and we can get into the why question. I won't get into it in depth, but the why question of why do we do this is that Canadian foreign policy, unfortunately for more than a century now, has been structured around two things. Supporting empire, historically British, today American, and supporting corp Canadian corporate interests abroad. That is overwhelmingly what drives foreign policy. Uh, the rhetoric about, you know, sometimes it's about the girls of Afghanistan, sometimes it's about uh, international rules-based order, feminist foreign policy. That's just rhetoric, helping the world's poor. There are, you know, some examples of some Canadian aid projects that do help the world's poor. I'm not saying that it, you know, but the overwhelming thrust of the policy, support for empire, support for corporate interests, and uh, I'll uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Eve. Uh, and uh, uh, I would like to uh, to continue now to uh, entertain Q. Q&A, question and answers. Uh, not all at the same time, please. <laughs> I'd just like to ask, what is the effect of the, uh, the, carp or the, the conservative government were change if they're not elected? Can't hear you well, Jim. So I think the question was was whether the it, things were changed if the conservatives got elected. And and uh, uh, not for the better. I I do as as much you heard what I laid out there. I do still think Trudeau is less bad than Harper, right? And I think that Jagmeet Singh would be a little bit less bad <laughs> on foreign policy than Trudeau. So you know I think if you got into it on the mining question, while what Trudeau has done is you know ninety seven percent the same as what Harper did. You know those. I prefer to have those, not those three uh, percent. You know, a little bit less bad, right? Um, on the case of you get it, go into each issue one by one. I don't think they've been. I, I, with the case with the case of Ukraine and Russia, I think that it's actually basically the same. I think Christian Freeland, for instance, is such a hawk, and she's a major force, just as much as a hawk. You know, Harper was a big hawk on that issue. Uh, Harper went to uh, after Yanukovych was ousted. He went there twice in six weeks. First, first uh, G7, first foreign leader to go to legitimate the coup after Yanukovych in 2014, and then he then he went again. Um, so, so, you know, I think on China, I didn't get into China, and we can get into that if people want. I think on China, actually, Trudeau is being pulled by the most militaristic pro-American forces in Canadian society. I actually, think NDP is worse on China 
than than the liberals. I, that's one where I think the liberals uh, they've gone too far in my, you know my opinion in joining the U.S. led campaign. But but they they are doing it more. They're more uh, they're more tied into the Canadian capitalists who want to make money off of China than the the military industrial complex. So 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 that's one where I think conservatives would be you know fairly substantially worse. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think that the Latin America coups, you know, with regards to Venezuela. In fact, the Venezuelan foreign minister said that that uh, Harper was actually better in the the in the 2015, 2014, 2015 period, and Christian Freeland was a real real hawk, and maybe that had to do with the NAFTA negotiations going on with Donald Trump. But so um, you got to go through them one by one to say where where the you know the differences would be. But the overwhelming the overwhelming uh, picture is that it's structural this isn't about that individual this individual it's structural it's it's to do with the political culture it's to do with the institutions in this country be that the you know the corporate sector be that the think tanks be that Canada's ties to Washington be that the military and his military which is this massively powerful institution is so integrated to the U.S. military so you know, be it white supremacy, be it the five eyes, uh, intelligence, uh, NATO, you know, these are there's these structural elements that explain uh, the continue the continuance between the different uh, the different uh, uh, governments. But no, I, this isn't in any way an argument for certainly not a, a vote for uh, for uh, Pierre Poliev. Uh, Trudeau is better. And on domestic issues, I think there are bigger differences. And on foreign policy issues, so on domestic issues, there are some, you know, some areas where Trudeau is substantially better. Um, but uh, on foreign policy, it's it's mostly uh, uh, the same. Jake, uh, thank you very much, Eve. Uh, Jake, you have a question. Yes, I do. Thank you very uh, much, Eve. Make it a question and not a statement, please. I know how you are. Yes. No. This is a question. Okay. Okay. Hold up. Eve, I thank you for what you did and what you said, uh, and I know you for many years. My question to you is, do you, in your opinion, do you think that Trudeau, of course, with the help of that uh, Miss Busybody, Christia Freeland, doing all what they're doing, namely the way they're doing it in South America, that they're going against any country who has leaders that uh, come to a bit of socialism, which US uh, rejects and unconditionally supporting Israel with its crimes, the way he shouts all over the world about Ukraine and about China and sending boat to South China Sea, like he was. the way he is coming more strong than I, today any leader in the world. Is it because he wants to show, on one hand, that he is a world leader, he is somebody to be counted, and second one is uh, basically it shows his immaturity in dealing in world arena, and consequently is actually damaging Canada. What's your opinion? That yeah, I mean, question, a Ellen. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot there's a lot there, and I, and I think there's, there's some interesting uh, um, questions there and interesting elements to to unpack in that. And I would say that you know a central element in 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 the why is that we don't do anything. And I say we, I mean the people. This is a this is like there's a no it's a no democracy terrain. The public is basically not part of the decision making when it comes to foreign policy issues. So that then means who who is the decision making? And the decision making is the the big mining companies, is the is the Canada's relationship to the U.S. empire, and so so Trudeau, you know, um, doing his you know aggressive stuff, like with with regards to hurting Canada. I think with regards to China, you can make a good case that it's not in Canada's economic self-interest to join uh, Washington's campaign, okay? What, as you mentioned, Canada sending naval vessels, 
through the South China Sea. Uh, Canada, of course, has uh, spy planes that have been flying off the coast right near uh, Chinese airspace. Um, and they boasted in their Asia Pacific strategy, they boast that we have been previously sending one naval vessel at a time. And now we're going to ramp that up to three naval vessels, kind of like patrolling around, uh, around China. And, and there, there is a pushback in elite Canadian circles. And that pushback comes from big capitalists, sometimes in the mining sectors, these people who I don't have, you know, like the head of Barrick Gold recently, criticizing their policy on China. Uh, you know, I don't like Barrick Gold, as I mentioned, I don't, like, I don't much like Barrick Gold. Uh, but when it comes to the China issue, I prefer, you know, just straight capitalist uh, exploitation and capitalist trade relations to, you know, pushing towards warfare and pushing, you know, going along with the U.S. empire and military industrial complex. Uh, so, so that's what that's one issue. Now, you know, the the general kind of like bombast is that you know this is unfortunately we're we're in denial about this in our in our uh, in our country, but this is. This isn't new, right? Trudeau on the 70th anniversary of NATO uh, a few years ago, before you know Russia's invasion, before this you know whole new wave of NATO, 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 he makes this like incredible declaration in, in, in 2019, incredible declaration about NATO has been a cent center of Canadian foreign policy and will continue this and just like totally bombastic kind of you know pro-NATO comment. Well, the US, uh, US, Britain, and Canada had the initial secret meetings in 1948 to establish NATO, right? Some people say NATO was a Canadian idea. And NATO was about basically US domination of the world. Uh, obviously much more complicated, we can get, in, get into more of that, but that's the essence of it. And, and Canada has been right at the core of pushing that. Um, so Trudeau is, is uh, you know, he had this, you know, Canada is back, peacekeeping, he talked about peacekeeping before being, you know, during election campaign, Canada will be back, his, you know, famous speech on election night. Um, but then as you, as you, you know, you, to, to like, to show how clearly Canada is not back and to show how, how like, you know, uh, hypocritical their, you know, stuff around Ukraine is, and, and it is, you know, Russia, what Russia is doing is illegal. It is brutal. But like, look at what they're, look at what Israel's doing. And we're just applauding it. We're like, not only, no, we're not just like, you know, endorsing it rhetorically. We're having pizza parties for the Canadians who go and join that country's military to, you know, bomb Gaza as they're doing as, as we speak, but as they did, you know, two years ago, a devastating round. And then in a previous devastating round, and the previous devastating round, and a previous step while they're stealing more land in the West Bank in contravention of international law. So, you know, if you were at all consistent, if you were at all consistent, we should be providing all kinds of weapons to the Palestinian resistance. If, if, if we need to be providing weapons to Ukraine to resist the illegal, brutal uh, Russian invasion, I mean, what Palestinians have been facing is far longer, uh, far clearer cut, quite frankly, in terms of the illegality and, and the, uh, uh, the you know, political dynamic. So... Um, yeah, that was kind of a roundabout uh, answer, but yeah, thank you. Um, in view of the time, uh, let's let's go on to uh, uh, Gary, who has his hands up. And uh... thank you, thank you, Eve. Um, this may touch a lot on what the last question, your last answer. <laughs> Given everything that you've said. And we can see that in uh, the newspapers, not as clearly as you define it, but if you read it properly, you can see it in the Toronto Star and the other newspapers and even the CBC. But Canadians consider themselves as very uh, peaceful and even polite. How, how is it that we have a government that is unpolite and certainly not peaceful and yet we like do you have a feeling of why do canadians the canadian people actually think of themselves as polite and and peaceful hmm. well i mean i think the 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 main uh explanation i mean i would distinguish between polite and 
I mean, I think the politeness thing is in partly in contrast to U.S. kind of uh, a, a sort of U.S. disposition, which um, is often less polite <laughs> than Canada. I, you know, on a, just at a personal level, I think that you know cultures have different dynamics that that lead to uh, the term defining a whole population as polite versus a whole population as not polite. I think is you know a little bit uh, tricky, but but. Uh, um, so I, so I would distinguish that, and it, it's partly the Americans, partly sort of a certain type of American putting that on Canada. You know, our self uh, description is partly imposed by a U.S. cultural uh, influence, which I think is often uh, fairly damaging. Now, we also, though, there has been a incredible uh, propaganda exercise in framing Canada as like a peacekeeping nation, right? And that was that has been central to to um, nationalist mythology. Uh, it's it's dissipating, but let's say until two thousand, it was very central to liberal party specifically nationalist mythology, and that's part of why Trudeau did the whole Canada's back. We're going to restart peacekeeping kind of rhetoric. Um, it's never had any basis in fact. Okay, it's never had any basis. In fact, I have a book called Lester Pearson's Peacekeeping: The Truth May Hurt. Okay, <laughs> and you know the mythology. If you believe the mythology, the truth does hurt because it, it's just so divorced from reality that it's um, it's comical, really. I mean, you know, Lester Pearson opposed the war in Vietnam. Yeah, right. Lester Pearson was on the public record dozens and dozens of times saying, "I quote: I support wholeheartedly." the U.S. peacekeeping and peacemaking effort in Vienna. I mean, that's what our prime minister, in his greatest, the greatest ever anti-war speech in the history of Canadian foreign policy, okay? Uh, purportedly, Temple University in 1965, Lester Pearson. He said, that's what I just quoted. That's what he said at that famous anti-war speech. <laughs> and that's, anyways, we'll get, get into that. But so, so um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's there, I have a book called A Propaganda System, how Canada's uh, governments, corporations, media, and academia sell war and exploitation. And this is deeply embedded in our cultural, ideological institutions of creating this myth of Canada being a benevolent international force. And peacekeeping is central to that. Um, it's a, the, the utility of it, from, a, from the standpoint of power, is that if the public assumes the best of Canadian foreign policy decision makers, if we assume the best of them, so we believe they're trying to do well, they believe in peace, then we just let it let them do their thing. Okay, we don't we don't question, we don't you know hold their feet to the fire. So it's it's very useful to the decision makers to have the population believe that because they basically can do whatever they want which is what happens. Yeah. Uh, and so that's why I've many, many times have stated that like the political project that I'm involved in is in, in, an important part of it is not, you know, obviously you want to campaign on specific issues, but more broadly, you want to build a critical consciousness of Canadian foreign policy so that we don't just trust them. We don't just say, oh, they say, oh, we're just trying to help Ukraine resist this terrible invasion. And so this is all we're trying to do. We just believe in sovereignty and we believe in, you know, uh, uh, people not being killed. Y you say, well, but you don't have a problem with people being killed in Gaza. So what is that? And so you, you so to me, you, you, we need to build critical consciousness. Well, Canadians don't just believe their, their decision makers are you know, trying to do well uh, uh, internationally because the history is, as I mentioned, support for empire, support for Canadian corporate interests. That's overwhelmingly what shapes policy. So, yeah, I mean, I think that people do believe the mythology. We need to challenge that. We need to undercut that. Um, and that's why, you know, talks like this, the, you know, the, the CBC will never allow this talk to happen, you know, on even at midnight on uh, CBC News World, they wouldn't allow, they don't allow this type of, this type of discussion. Um, so it's why it's this kind of discussion is important in those venues where we can have this type of discussion. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Francis, please uh, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much for your comments, Eve. 
Um, I have three quick questions. Uh, uh, actually, one of them is more in depth. So I, the, the first one is Christia Freeland. You describe her as a hawk. I've certainly witnessed that and wondered if it was because she was Ukrainian and it's Ukraine and she's being personally nationalistic. Uh, or do you think the hawkishness is a lot broader than that for her, that she just really likes basically uh, empire? Uh, would the NDP have the courage to face off against big mining or would they just collapse and, and follow the same policies? And the big question, how can we make social democracy more acceptable in Canada and around the world? Why are we still hanging on to this old dichotomy of capitalism versus communism when neither are working and we need a whole new paradigm that is both earth and people friendly? Yeah, well, with regards to uh, Freeland, She's clearly on Ukraine. She is clearly has a personal invested ideological, you know, this goes back to the late 1980s when she was young, you know, young activist going and supporting Ukrainian nationalism and breaking up of the Soviet Union. So that, that that's not, there's no doubt that she's and her grandfather being a Nazi collaborator and, you know, the, a particular type of Ukrainian nationalism that is a very homogenous type of nationalism that is generally rejected in the eastern and southern part of the country. Um, so that that's no doubt. No, but if you look at her position in Venezuela, she's, you know, she was, she doesn't have much of a personal, you know, nationalistic ideological stake in Venezuela, but she was a hawk there too. So it's clearly mostly about her broader alignment with the U.S. empire. There's that, the uh, memo that the, uh, the, Canadian, the the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa put out when Freeland was appointed foreign minister in 2017 and that, that Canada has adopted an America first uh, foreign policy. That's what the U.S. Embassy wrote to the State Department, right? So they understood that Freeland, that's where she was coming from. With regards to mining, if, if I heard the question correctly, NDP mining, I, I think that I'm very critical of NDP foreign policy. It's mostly the same as the other two big parties. There's some areas on Palestine, they've actually improved substantially in the last couple of years. Huge, that take huge campaigning within, within the party and, and outside the party, but there's some positive, very clear positive developments in that front. Again, not, not closer as far as they should be going, but positive development. Um, on mining, mining would be an issue where I think the NDP would or has been more China and, 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 and Russia, they're just as bad, or in some cases, even worse. Uh, uh, but mining is an issue where they have been better. They've been pushing on the mining question. I think that the, you know, even clearly within the Liberal Party, there's big divisions on the mining question. And the Liberals were looking like they were going to come in with an ombudsperson that had some real teeth, that was something serious. And they were, that was scuttled by the power of the mining company's lobby. So I think that that would be an issue where the NDP likely would likely would be uh, you know, substantially better, right? Um, but, but you have to go through the issues one by one and, and the broad outlook would be that the NDP on foreign policy would be um, you know, not, much, not much different than the Liberals, though a little bit less bad. Uh, and that's not talking about domestic issues. I think there are some domestic issues where they would be you know, sub substantially better. I think when it comes to the question of social democracy, I don't think, I mean, it's a question of organization. It's not a question of the, the population is totally on board with social democracy. I mean, I, I don't think polling is, you know, shows consistently that, that, that you know, social programs and stuff like that have, have, have popular support. So, I, you know, I don't think that most Canadians don't identify themselves as capitalists. That's not how they, they're, they're actually as likely a poll saw not long ago. I think it was even a Fraser Institute. It was like a remarkable number of the population calls them if they self-identify as socialists, particularly skewed younger. So, so I don't think that there is, um, you know, but, but it's a question of power, right? And, and you know, there are some institutions uh, in Canada that, that, you know, like the union movement with all with various problems, it does actually organize for social democracy and 
in, in you know, it, ha it has some institutional power. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so, but, 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 you know, the capitalists still have most of the power and they still have most of the think tanks and they still own most of the media and they still, you know, so, so that's just a question of organizing. I don't think there's any problem with regards to popular opinion uh, on support for social democracy. It's a matter of, uh, you know, organizing power and, and that, you know, what does that mean? I think there's, you know, a, a thousand different things that means, you know, organizing more uh, non-unionized workplaces. It means, uh, you know, rebuilding the, the campaigns for uh, Medicare that, you know, got Medicare going back, you know, 50 plus years ago. It means, uh, you know, the campaigning for, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, dental care and, and, and you know, it's, so it's like, you know, we rekindling the anti-corporate kind of globalization movement of the late 90s, early 2000s, which is what I, you know, that, you know, politicized me and that, that those types of sort of challenging capitalist kind of movements. Um, there's, there's really no uh, magical formula there. I know many movements that are, you know, attempting to the progressive international attempting to kind of organize this stuff at a, at a broad international level. Um, yeah. But when we okay. fight for ourselves, Eve, uh, like when we're fighting for pharmacare and denticare and, and all those things, I agree with you. The Council of Canadians actually has those as its priorities. Uh, but uh, what I'm, uh, it doesn't solve our foreign policy. You know, I, I, it's just, we're, <laughs> our foreign policy has been so, so bad for so long and we're not doing anything about it yeah and groups like the council of canadians are very reticent i mean lots of i've you know spoken to many 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 council Canadians chapters and i'm friends with many people who lead council Canadian chapters but as a macro then the national level council of canadians mostly wants to 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 stay out of it and it was actually just recently there was a resolution that uh, uh one of the chapters uh put i think maybe the london ontario chapter around uh, Canada out of NATO, and uh, I'm you know privy to some of the dis internal discussions that happened, and they it was we don't want to touch that right now. This kind of uh, uh, you know so yeah, I mean it's it's ref it's a reflection of the political climate. It's a reflection of nationalism. Unfortunately, you know our political culture is very nationalistic. Um, you know that that goes all throughout, you know, how we, how we interact, um, you know, if, if somebody has a Canadian passport, they have, you know, higher rights than somebody who doesn't, that's kind of like embedded in our, in our political culture. And, um, and uh, yeah, so genuine international, I believe that like, you, you're not going to deal with the, cl the climate crisis without genuine internationalism. Right? Yeah. You know, but prior to the climate crisis, I, I would, you know, or I didn't. I grew up. I, I was born amidst the climate crisis, even if we didn't recognize it at that at that point. But clearly, the climate, was going, climate crisis is going on a long time. But 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 even without the climate crisis, I believe in internationalism as fundamental to to our politics. But I don't know how we actually going to. Uh, if even if you didn't agree with that, I don't know how we're going to deal with the climate crisis without internationalism. Because it, it's a global, it's a global question, and that's part of why that you know what's so dangerous about these you know ratcheting up tensions with China, the U.S. and China. If we want to deal with the climate crisis, like you, you can't have the two biggest economies, the two most powerful countries locked into this into this you know zero sum kind of uh, new cold war, and and so you know I think that and I think that we're seeing that even with the environmental movement, how they've reacted to the the NATO proxy war, I, I think that they're they've, they've they've been they've been mistaken. I think we have to have geopolitics have to be part of a, a, a serious uh, climate movement because though that shapes how you know we we come to agreements around lessening uh, greenhouse gas emissions, let alone the sort of injustices of of um, of um, how the impacts of, of the climate disturbances. But um, 
yeah, I think certainly we need to uh, build uh, internationalism without throughout the unions, throughout Council of Canadians, throughout different feminist organizations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Let's okay. give Ati a chance. <laughs> yes, Ati, uh, you absolutely last question, okay? <laughs> yes. We have our business meeting to do. <laughs> yes, well, well, that's an honor. Thank you, Eve. Uh, this is uh, very uh, useful to me, having been out of the country a bit, to get this type of uh, very uh, comprehensive and succinct and clear rundown of Canadian foreign policy. I'm not going to ask you a big uh, a theoretical question. There's just a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I, I, I think one of the things I have in President of Canada something good about was criticizing uh, human rights and the treatment of women in Saudi Arabia and for that Saudi Arabia blacklisted Canada and a lot of Saudi students left Canada. I, I wonder what the upshot of that is. I hadn't heard. And the second thing is I don't know if you're aware in the context of this event that there's been a video going around about I believe it was at Carleton University uh, you and our former um, the former speaker of ours, uh, Wendy, uh, Wendy um, Lorenz, uh, were uh, cross-examining the Bob Ray, and uh, and that clip made you both look very bad. It looked like you were just disrupting an open democratic uh, con uh, discussion. Uh, it didn't put that in the right context. Would you like to comment on what happened there and what the upshot of that was? Uh, sure. So, well, first of all, I'll do the Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So there was a, 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 a began, I believe, I believe it was a tweet uh, critical of Saudi human rights uh, violations and Saudi Arabia reacted uh, aggressively and it led to a, a kind of um, a downgrading of Canada Saudi relations. Uh, that was always, I think, uh, quite uh, hyped up. There was never any ending of Canadian arms sales. So the Canadian arms sales, what happened was there was a pause put on of new permits, okay, of, of okaying new new arms permits. So all the, all that were all the permits that had been okayed, and the the you know that all continued. So and and even that's now mostly been um, uh, kind of papered over. Uh, with regards to the Bob Ray uh, incident, that was at the University of Ottawa. And um, that was Tamara Lawrence who spoke. Um, uh, and we did, I think, you know, the, the, the way that you stated it um, uh, is not, you know, incorrect in the sense that it was a, it was a public meeting and Bob Ray was speaking and uh, Tamara began, I next, and then Dimitri third, um, we interrupted him. And um, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I'm, I, I, I don't in any way walk away from that. I, I think that um, that the Canadian ambassador to the UN is they were not talking about some sort of like just some academic uh, debate. That's, uh, you know, this is somebody who is a uh, policy instigator. And um, I have interrupted uh uh, press conferences of uh, Justin Trudeau, of Christian Freeland, of Melanie Jolie, of of uh, many many uh, Jagmeet Singh even uh, uh, former Conservative leader um, O'Toole. Um, so I don't you know I we we even had a group called Disruption Network Canada where we were sharing information uh, nationally about where different ministers were speaking. Uh, for uh, interventions. I, I think that we live in a, uh, a political climate where the dominant media just refuse to talk about these issues. And if you want to try to get, you know, break through into the media with some of these uh, criticisms, this is, this is what you got to do. I mean, in case of the Bob Ray thing, you know, it, it, it did disrupt the meeting. It probably lasted a full, in total, it was maybe 10 minutes. The meeting continued. You know, he went on, spoke for a big chunk before and then went on afterwards and, you know, we left and, 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 and whatever. Um, I, I just, in that, that case, I just was actually stayed seated in my chair uh, and I challenged what, what, he, what he had voted at the UN. I, I, I detailed how he voted against a resolution condemning uh, neo-Nazism. He had just done that. Uh, voted resolutions against Palestinian rights, voted against uh, 
a resolution calling for um, a global equity about changing the international eco economic order. Um, so so uh, it's a tactic. I know it's a tactic that not everyone you know is loves, um, but it, unfortunately, it's a it's an often a very effective tactic. I the probably the clearest example is. Um, uh, Steve Angulbo, the environment minister, I found out he was speaking uh, about six, seven blocks from where I live in Montreal, press conference on a totally unrelated issue. I went there with a placard, say, criminel uh, climatique, uh, climate criminal, and I interrupted the press conference about him being about the Bay du Nord, the big expansion of, of, of oil uh, uh, extraction they, in that time they had just agreed to a few weeks uh, earlier. And uh, and it got all over. Even the New York Times talked about him being disrupted as a, a climate criminal. So so it's not it's not following the sort of like an academic uh, debate kind of structure. But these are, you know, we, we I, you know we have to be I, we have to understand that if we're going to be effective, we have to have a whole slew of different tactics. I would prefer to just be able to submit an op-ed to the Globe Mail that details out my positions. The Globe Mail, the Toronto Star, CBC are not willing to take an op-ed that that you know details out these criticisms. So you got to find other ways of doing it. One of the ways I do it is I publish articles on you know left-wing websites and my own website, and you know speak at these types of forums. Another way you break break through the the uh, the media kind of uh, 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 dynamic is to disrupt politicians. Thank you, Eve. You're one of the reasons why CUSJ exists. We have to have some voice for other alternate ideas. And it's one of the reasons that I just could not accept the fact that we would be shutting down because what the heck, you know, so few chances to have these voices heard. Eve, before you go, can you just make a little, um, what do you call it, publicity for your uh, radio or your, your blog pro, uh, thing on Monday morning, Monday afternoon? Yeah, I do. Uh, I do a, a, a Canadian Foreign Policy Hour every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern, and it's just like an hour long. It's about half the time I have a guest that delves into a specific issue of Canadian foreign policy, and half the time it's just me. Um, I usually start off with a sort of a, a recap of important uh, foreign policy events. And another thing I would I would point out, um, people can, if you're interested in my articles, I always publish them on my website evingler.com, and you can get sign up to both the Foreign Policy Hour and to receive my articles through the site. The other thing is that if people are interested in just Canadian foreign policy more generally, if you're not on the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute's email list, I would suggest getting on that. Uh, there's regular uh, webinars, action alerts, uh, you know, articles that are sent out, usually about, a, about one email a week. It's not, it's not too heavy, um, but you can go to uh, foreignpolicy.ca uh, if you're interested in, 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 in that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming and talking to us. Thanks, uh, everyone. We're going to take a five-minute break so everybody has a chance to use the washroom if they need it. That's and then we'll come back and, and stretch your legs or whatever. And then we'll come back. And Margaret, we can help you with your video problem. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. And see you in five minutes.